And at this time, I'd like to invite Tanya Powers to start us off. Good afternoon, Highline College. I am Tanya Powers. I am Alaska Native, she, her, hers pronouns. And I have the pleasure of being able to introduce Melody Milner. She's an enrolled member of the Khaled's tribe. She was born in Lakewood, Washington and was raised primarily in Tacoma, Washington. She now lives in Federal Way. She is a second year college student attending Highline College and she works on campus at the TRIO Center as the Passport to Careers Peer Mentor. She serves as Vice President of the Indigenous Student Association and is involved with the Native Student Success Summit Planning Committee. She plans to finish her AA degree, pursue her BAS at Highline, and eventually plans to further her education at a university. Melody strives for success, as well as helping and encouraging others to strive for success. In her free time, she likes to relax with family and friends, especially relaxing anywhere there's a waterfront with a view. We're so pleased to have Melody here today, who will be doing our land acknowledgement. Hi. I would like to acknowledge the people whose land we gather on today. Present Day Des Moines is located on the traditional village sites of the Muckleshoot, Duwamish, Puyallup, and many other tribes who made their homes on these lands and along these waters. Let us also acknowledge the robust indigenous communities made up of tribal diversity that originate from around the country and whose journeys have brought them here and of and to other locations by ways of forced displacement and seeking opportunities. Today, the same communities celebrate their heritage, showing resilience and tenacity that would be greatly admired by their ancestors. Thank you. Thank you, Melody. It's so nice to have you with us today and also um, much gratitude to Indigenous Rising as well. Hello, Highline. Welcome to the second annual Equity Development Institute. Um, we are on a roll here. We modified from a full day to a half day. So we hope that you will enjoy this afternoon with all of us. Um, in honoring our communities and honoring our theme of reclaiming education, our collective responsibility. We wanted to give a special welcome to our Muslim community, our Highline fam. Ramadan Mubarak to you and your loved ones. Thank you so much for being with us today. We really, we really, see, we, we virtually see you because I technically can't see you, but thank you for being here. Um, also today is another important day in our global community. It's May Day. And it's a day where globally it's observed and we, we honor the struggle of the working people. And amongst coronavirus and COVID-19, whatever you want to call it, um, we're seeing that more and more. We're seeing worker protections and not enough PPE and um, people um, being in spaces that are not always so safe. And so with that being said, I also want to give a very special thank you to our Highline College Facilities Department. If we were physically in person, you would have been the crew that would have set it up, you would have sanitized it, you would have ensured that that was a safe and enjoyable experience for us. So we wanna thank you for that because we know you've been doing that while, you, while we have all been working virtually from home, you have been sanitizing and cleaning and ensuring that the physical space that we will one day return to um, is suitable for our working conditions. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And along with the gratitude, uh, we would like to give a special thank you to our planning committee. And I did have a photo that I wonder if I can pop that back up there so that you can see our awesome planning committee. Maybe not. My technology skills aren't the best today, so I apologize for that. But you saw that awesome photo of all of our planning committee members. So we will put that in rotation again so that you can see them. We'd like to give them a thank you. Um, this year was my first year on the Equity Development Institute Planning Committee. So if you're down with what we're doing today, maybe next year will be your first day on the planning committee. 
And we also want to add our honorary committee members, Mark Lentini and Bob Heyer, who have made sure that today is accessible to us all. And a special, special, special shout out to our equity task force chairs, Natalie Bajorga. I don't know if I said that correctly. I apologize if I didn't. And Rakitha Reed for leading our institution, our committee, our planning committee, always keeping us on track and making sure that equity is possible for us to engage with and that the logistics are smooth and that everyone's cared for and listened to. You all are phenomenal facilitators and know how to lead a bold group of people. So thank you for that. And so with that, we are going to launch into what today is all about. So welcome, get comfortable, and we hope that you enjoy your afternoon with us. Good afternoon, Highline College. When it comes to equity, I am no stranger uh, to the endurance and resilience it takes to sit in discomfort. And uh, my name, Joshua Magianis, I work with Fuente and also in the Counseling Center. I've been at the college for over 16 years and I'm uh, excited that this is our second annual EDI here at Highline. I also wanna say that the work is never complete. Um, I've seen people come and go, divisions take new shape. And the one constant is who usually shows up to participate, not just in a physical sense, but through an equity-minded lens. See, because for me, it truly takes, <clears throat> it takes us acknowledging that when we go into the discomfort, we take a risk and losing something, sometimes a friend, a colleague, or a family member. This is the challenge I wake up to daily because working toward equity isn't an option for me, and I do not get to avoid what is in front of me. Times are very different than what we're used to, and that is real talk. We are also probably very tired and frustrated. And with that said, it goes without saying that equity, diversity, and inclusion work continues as we move forward as a country, as an institution of higher education. So thank you for being here and challenging yourself to dig a little deeper this year as we get into the work that is both an internal journey and a journey we must go on together in order to <laughs> create change and understanding that it is sustainable. Equity and inclusion work can no longer be done in silos, ignored, or given a choice to participate in. It is all our responsibility to achieve self-understanding and acknowledge our own growth edge when it comes to equity and inclusion. We must engage in and embrace the discomfort. So my challenge to you, my colleagues and friends, is to ask, what am I doing to be a part of the collective and create space that is culturally responsive in our classrooms, our office space, and with one another? It's important now more than ever <clears throat> and important for us to continue to carry forward what we learned today and implement now and when we come back together again face-to-face -to -face on campus. I'm excited for all of you and hope you play it big and not small. This work is too important and crucial for us and our campus as we continue to do better. We can always reach more than we thought we once could. When I think about reclaiming education and what collective responsibility is or looks like, it's one where all my students in my classes are seen. And when my fellow colleagues at all levels of the institution are able to be at work and join one another with integrity and appreciation and respect, when events are attended equally, not just our staple events, and not always by those who always attend. Lastly, when it is transparent on what our work is and how we will achieve it together. We have an opportunity now to work on what we want our best to look like when we get the opportunity to go back to campus. Will you use this opportunity wisely? Why don't we take a look and what our colleagues have to say about what reclaiming education, a collective responsibility, means to them. While reflecting on reclaiming education, uh, collective responsibility, I think my role as president is to make sure that our students, staff, and faculty have the tools and resources for them to be successful. So for our students to achieve their educational goals, um, even if they don't know what those goals are at the time, uh, but to be able to create a pathway for them to be successful and embrace 
um, all the goals and talents that they possess and that they deserve to have. And for our staff and faculty, making sure that we have the resources to model success and to model service, um, rather it's instruction or service delivery uh, to our students. Um, advocating at a national level, advocating at a local level, um, but again, putting the services and needs of our student staff and faculty first. Good afternoon, Highline family. My name is Doris Martinez. She, her, her pronouns, and I serve as the director for the Center for Cultural and Inclusive Excellence. My name is Tanya Powers. I'm Alaska Native, St. Lawrence Island Dupic, Associate Dean for BAS and Workforce Pathways. She, her, hers. Hey, Highline, and I am Aisha Valencia, she, her, hers pronouns, and I'm the Associate Dean for Student Life. And why you see these three beautiful faces on the screen today is because we had the opportunity about a year and a half ago to attend the People's Institute. Uh, was the two and a half day institute in particular, um, the name of it was Undoing Institutional Racism. And it focused on structures that perpetuate racism. And the Equity Task Force asked us to reflect on some things that we've learned from the institute and how we've implemented that in our work since um, that last time we met about a little bit over a year and a half ago. So we wanted to share some reflections with you today. There was so much that the Undoing Institutional Racism uh, session taught us. However, one of the things that stood out to us was the continuum on becoming an anti-racist multicultural institution, which is a chart that you see right in front of you. As y'all can see, there are six different points. So where are institutions now and where institutions need to go? And in the room, we had about 30 uh, folks, leadership, um, individuals from our institution, and we collectively looked at Highline and identified ourselves between a two and a three. So a club institution and a multicultural institution. And for Highline being the most diverse institution uh, in the state of Washington, we thrive ourselves and strive to be um, inclusive, um, culturally responsive. It's a little alarming that we would look at ourselves between a two and a three. And what does that say about the collective work that we are doing or not doing? So what we are looking at now is a call to action. We do not want to remain at a two or three. We want to strive for a five or a six. And so that requires really doing uh, deep reflective work around looking at how we address our own personal biases, look at the biases that are in our institution and through our systems. And to add to that, another thing that was revealing, I guess you could call it that, is how much work our institution still needs to do to reshape gatekeeping. The People's Institute offered different principles and values that we could use to build a movement for social justice and equity, and reshaping gatekeeping was one of those. And so I want to read to you what that is so you can ponder for yourself about how do you think Highline is doing in this category. So reshaping gatekeeping as the People's Institute defines it is, quote, we recognize that persons who work in institutions often function as gatekeepers who ensure that the institution perpetuates itself. Gatekeepers who operate with anti-racist values and who maintain an accountable relationship with the community can help to generate institutional transformation rather than perpetuate an unjust status quo, end quote. And I think I can speak for almost everyone that attended this, that we identified collectively as Highline College leadership, um, directors, deans, department chairs, coordinators, vice presidents, that we all have a role as gatekeepers, whether we realize it or not, and that we all have a lot of work to do 
to stop gatekeeping, starting with acknowledging where we're doing it and how do we start to dismantle these structures and these, these policies um, or people that are in these places as gatekeepers. So in closing, we ask you, how do you apply reclaiming education in your daily practice? Hi, Highline College. Now, here's our college president, Dr. John Mosby. Hello, Highline College. Happy Friday, happy May 1st. In some ways, it seems that May 1st flew by here, and in other ways, it felt like it's taken a long time to get to May 1st, but either way, uh, we are here. And um, a lot of the words I was gonna say, actually Dean Valencia uh, mentioned earlier, which is great. And I just wanna echo um, what Aisha was saying. I just wanna take a moment and really just thank the uh, Equity Task Force, the Planning Committee um, in particular, I wanna highlight, um, Natalie and Aisha, uh, this work is to, to put an event on is extremely challenging anyway, and of this magnitude. And then to be able to put it 100% virtual in a very short time period, um, much like what we've had to do with our emergency remote teaching and service delivery is quite a feat. Uh, so many thanks to the task force, the committee, because I want to make sure I, I don't forget anybody, um, just the collection of people who I think have just done a great job. And again, very proud to be a part of Highline, very proud to serve as president, very humbled to serve as president of the institution. Um, as we uh, continue uh, this amazing afternoon, I, I want to you know, really take a moment and for us to really be able to sit back for a moment and reflect on the past year, but on the past couple of months in particular. Um, a few months ago, we never thought we would be dealing, addressing, being challenged in a way that we never thought possible. We also thought a few months ago, the fact of being able to to provide instruction, to provide service delivery of, of, of all sorts from uh, a virtual, primarily virtual format was not even possible. How can we provide um, instruction, basically changing that overnight? How could we provide financial aid and financial support uh, to our students? How could we be able to provide uh, technology, not just for our students, um, because many of them don't have that, but for our numerous staff and faculty who don't have, who didn't have the technology and resources. Um, and while we are continually working and striving to meet all those needs, it's something that we should celebrate two months later that people are getting served. It's challenging, it's clunky, Sometimes it's messy, but we are serving our communities. Our faculty are doing a phenomenal job of providing instruction. Our staff are providing a phenomenal job of really being able to provide services for our students. And our students are doing a phenomenal job being resilient and again, striving to the best of their abilities to achieve their educational goals in spite of the uh, mounting challenges that affect um, on a local, national, and global level. So I just wanted to take a moment and always in terms of just remembering that we can focus on the amazing positives and the amazing accomplishments that's going on and at the same time know that there is much, much more work to do, um, but I'm confident that we are moving forward. And to that end, this is why I'm so excited that we're doing uh, our EDI day today, our second annual one. Um, and I encourage all of us as we uh, continue this afternoon, as I look at the participant number, we had over 340 participants um, on a Friday afternoon, um, that you continue to do a few things, that you focus, continue to focus 
on the challenges ahead of us and our goals and what we need to do to serve our entire community. That you explore opportunities and challenge yourself in terms of how we think, how we move, how we act, and, and the implications and the benefits that that has to one another. And to learn. Um, I am such a fan of just being able to try to live my life to learn as much as I can. And I learn every day. And that's my goal to continue to learn to be the best possible educator, advocate, colleague, friend, son, uh, human being as much as I can. And I would encourage you to have, I'm sure you do, that same mindset and that same drive and wish, um, not just for this afternoon, but, but moving forward. Um, and lastly, please take the time today to enjoy an opportunity that very few institutions across our country have. There are very few institutions that are doing the work and attempting to do the work and challenge ourselves um, that other places aren't. And lastly, in terms of, again, going back to uh, collective responsibility, re reclaiming our education, um, my commitment and my hope is to make sure that every single person that is a part of the Highline College family is seen, seen every day, be it in the classroom, on Zoom, in when you're eating on campus, when you're walking on campus, in the parking lot, as you wait for the bus that you are seen on this campus. Wishing you all a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Mosby. That was inspirational and we appreciate you taking a moment to be with us as we welcome our community virtually to such an important day. Um, we, we heard a lot of um, chat in our chat box around the blurriness of the video. So I just wanna address that real quickly and wanna say we are so sorry um, as we are all experiencing unstable internet connections and um, learning how to convert videos and making captioning. Um, this has been quite the learning curve. So we apologize for the blurriness of that um, document that definitely was um, something that we just saw all together live in the same moment. So we will go ahead and send out an email attachment with those two documents that were referenced in that video. So you can take some time and learn a little bit more about those concepts and topics and then bring that back to your department and discuss. And so now um, we would like to bring back Dr. Mosby and he has the honor today to introduce our speakers that are also spending some time today with us. So shout out to our speakers and thank you again, Dr. Mosby. No problem, thank you very much. Um, I, I, it's my pleasure to, and I'm gonna have to read because uh, the bio is pretty extensive and pretty outstanding, so I don't wanna forget anything. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Esmeralda Hernandez Hamid. Esmeralda has worked at the Center of Urban Education as a project specialist for over three years. At CUE, she works with practitioners at community colleges and four-year institutions across the U.S. to close racial equity gaps in areas like transfer, faculty hiring, and course completion. To this end, she facilitates discussions on race and equity-mindedness in Lee's practitioner inquiry into their everyday practices, policies, and structures. She holds a BA in political science and minor in education from the University of California, Irvine. She is also finishing her PhD in higher education with a focus on organizational behavior and management at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Her research interests revolve around higher education institutions change or do not change to align with equity and social justice. Her dissertation focuses on how practitioners act individually and collectively to institutionalize change that supports undocumented students on their campus. It's my pleasure to introduce again, Esmeralda Hernandez Hamid. Thank you so much, Dr. Mosby, um, for, that, uh, for that introduction. And I'm so happy to be here. Thank you um, to the Equity Task Force, to the Planning Committee, 
um, to Rakitia and Natalie, who I was meeting with uh, to plan for this event. Uh, I I already, I, I want to uh, circle back to something that Dr. Mosby said, uh, which is that very few institutions are doing um, this type of equity work. And, um, and, and I can already see from the beginning, the first 30 minutes of this presentation that there was so much intentionality that went into this day and into at least this first 30 minutes. Uh, and that is the kind of intentionality that I hope that our work uh, through the Center for Urban Education uh, will, will help others at the institution continue uh, that work. And so, um, as Dr. Mosby said, uh, my name is Esmeralda, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, I'm going to be taking us through a presentation that I've put together um, that's kind of an introduction to equity um, and to equity as the Center for Urban Education uh, understands it. And, um, and as we go through the hour and then into our breakout sessions, we hope to introduce equity and also to practice, you know, how do we start to step back from our day-to-day -day practices and really ask ourselves, who is our institution working for? How am I serving racial equity? So let me bring up that presentation now and we'll get started. All right, everyone saying that, I hope. And I wanted to get started, um, and I should note there were 14 images on this slide, and because of um, some uh, Zoom, um, so, so, some things with Zoom, we had to put it down to 10 so that everyone can participate in the polling um, that I wanted to do. Um, so it was very hard to choose only 10 images. But I, we usually, I usually use this image, which we will now as well, to um, think about um, our, our own college experiences. But before we get to that, I do want to acknowledge, as many have already, that we are in a pandemic, um, that it is a crisis, that we are working in a crisis, right? And that uh, I myself am in an, you know, an imperfect place, um, right? Trying to give you this information and we're all doing our best. And so I wanted to just check in with everybody on how, um, on how you're feeling and try to use these images, you know, see if any of one of these images, um, you feel you can relate to it. Uh, on, on how you're feeling. And so I'm going to launch this poll now. You see that the images are numbered. And then so if, uh, if you find an image that kind of speaks to the way that you're feeling right now, go ahead and uh, click that number. And, um, and I am going to wait a few, uh, maybe about 30 seconds for people to place in their answers, and then we'll be able to see the results. Share results. Okay, so here uh, we can we can see the results of the poll. Hopefully, uh, the images are on the PowerPoint. And if you didn't, you weren't able to um, do this poll. I'll have one more question after this. But you see, uh, most people are relating to image number six, right? Which uh, which makes sense. It's the image of the two hands that are just above water and um, and that makes total sense for this situation. Um, so thank you so much for uh, for sharing that. But there are also um, folks who are relating to many of the other images as well. And um, and I, I I feel all of you. I'm I'm with you. Uh, whether you have support, where you whether you know you are um, barely surviving, um, that is all normal and, um, and okay in this situation. And, um, and I 
do hope uh, that if you do need help, that you can find support um, uh, at this time. I'm going to stop sharing this, and then I'm going to go to question number two. Using the same images, Um, answer, you know, which of these images on the screen describe your own higher education experience? And it seems like a lot of people related to number seven, just maybe a lot of studying. Um, there were 13, 14% of you related to number three, you know, really getting maybe a hand up to the top. Uh, related to number two, really climbing that mountain, maybe with, you know, with others that are, um, that are there as well. Great. And it's, you know, and so I do this, of course, as just a warm up to get us thinking about our own experiences. Um, Oftentimes, our own experiences really shape the way that we're going into the way that we do our work, uh, the way that we see the world, uh, and you know, in in many ways, it can it can help us uh, to do our work, and in some ways, um, it can also blind us to the experiences of others. And so, it's really great to just kind of get a feel for you know, how, um, how people felt throughout their, their whole experience. Um, and as we already kind of uh, acknowledge, of course, the, um, the state that we're in, in this pandemic. Um, and it's also in these times of crisis that it can be difficult for us to really focus on racial equity and the development of our own equity mindedness. So I, I commend Highline College for continuing to move forward with this institute, even under all of these restrictions. And that's, it's particularly important because you know, we have to remember that implicit bias tends to occur more under the circumstances of stress and lack of information and time pressure. And I know that you all are, uh, are undergoing those kinds of, um, of things right now. So it's actually under times like, in times like this, that we really need to think about um, racial equity even more and be more intentional about it because it's not at the forefront of our mind, because we are dealing with other, uh, with other things, uh, for some who are living the experience and who are also experiencing racism every day, um, it can be at the forefront, right? And I have to think about uh, particularly um, Asian, Asian American, Pacific Islander uh, folks who are un undergoing um, and experiencing a lot of xenophobia uh, uh, at this time, um, uh, and and all everyone who is feeling kind of that those um, racial experiences and uh, experiencing just that frustration from everyone um, that is that is causing uh, stress and is causing stress related to our minoritized identities as well. Um, also, uh, before we start, I should say, right, for uh, the Center for Urban Education today, I will be talking uh, as we go into the agenda about uh, particularly racial equity. Um, that said, um, all sorts of equity are important. We know that there are many minoritized populations, um, right, LGBTQ folks. Um, uh, foster youth, um, veterans, uh, low-income students, uh, those are all important to think about um, at this moment. Um, the Center for Urban Education, we focus particularly on racial equity because we find it is the hardest one to talk about. Um, and But all of the things that you will learn today, we hope that you can absolutely uh, apply to any minoritized student group as you think about how do I more intentionally serve them in the institution. 
Uh, so I did want to acknowledge that as well. So today um, we already went through our welcome and warm up, uh, and then we're just gonna we're gonna define equity and equity mindedness. Uh, we're gonna go through Q's theory of change um, and looking at some Highline college data as a place to start um, our conversations around racial equity and what it looks like at Highline College. And then we'll we'll talk a little bit about inquiry as a way to move into our breakout sessions and start to um, put put uh, these ideas that we start to talk about in uh, into practice. So defining equity. And so we say at the Center for Urban Education that equity is not equality and equity is not diversity. And so why is uh, equity not equality? All right, so equality imagines a, a world, uh, an equal world, right? Um, in which every student, as you see in this image, has the same uh, kind of journey to their goals, right? Uh, but we know that the world isn't equal, right? And that you might have students that on one end, uh, you know, are, have access to scholarships, um, their parents went to college, they had access to honors courses, um, they have active social networks and social capital. On the other end, we might have students who went to poorly funded schools, had less skilled teachers, had high counselor student ratios, had a truncated curriculum. They're kind of coming out of this hole, right? And um, so, and so there's something yet that I hadn't haven't talked about about this image, but that all of us kind of know already, right? And that I am insinuating through this image that most racially minoritized students. Um, are are coming out of that hole, and that maybe our uh, more privileged students, our white students in particular, some uh, Asian populations, that they are um, on the side with all of um, those privileges and access, right? And I we know, of course, that that's not always true. That there are um, some racially minoritized students who parents did go to college or who did have access to those honors courses. Um, but there is a reason why there is a large pattern in the United States about why uh, many and most uh, racially minoritized uh, students fall in uh, getting out of the hole and uh, where white students are more likely to have access to those, uh, to those privileges. And that has to do with um, the history of racism in the United States. And so there are a great number of institutions and policies in the United States that have contributed to structural racism in the United States, right? So of course, um, uh, some of those are slavery, um, and uh, and after slavery, Jim Crow laws, um, the denial of voting rights, uh, the redlining, so that we start to see extreme uh, so and which always was there, uh, extreme segregation um, in the United States uh, uh, between racial groups. Right. So uh, you and of course with all of that, uh, there's policies on funding schools um, uh, and tying the funding of schools to tax dollars. And of course, when um, all, uh, when racially minoritized folks tended to live in uh, lower valued areas, then that led to uh, poor funding of schools. Um, the, what we see today is an accumulation of wealth, right, from those who did not have to, uh, were not subject to all of these policies from, uh, and, uh, and these policies then did institutions, uh, which included 
the government, of course, education, um, uh, the legal uh, sector, right, um, law and um, policing, uh, as well as, as banking uh, and being able to get loans, right? So, uh, and education, right? And not, and for example, with uh, Black people and uh, throughout the history, also uh, Latinx and um, other um, racially minoritized groups not being able to access higher education or um, equal education, right? So, um, so that's why we see then this uh, pattern in which we do see most uh, racially minoritized folks um, in in a coming out of that hole, right? It is because of this legacy of uh, of policies and practices um, that have gotten us uh, to this point, and that is something that we need to acknowledge, right? And needs to be acknowledged in order uh, to move forward and to understand that racism still exists because of this legacy. But in addition to that, um, we say that if, this, if the latter is the institution, that students are coming in with a broken ladder, right? And particularly racially minoritized students, uh, you know, they're coming in with very specific barriers within the institution. Uh, some of those might be microaggressions, uh, implicit bias, disproportionate remediation, right? And, um, and depending on the minoritized group that you're a part of, right, um, uh, whether it be gender or uh, sexuality, the latter might be broken for different reasons, right? So. Uh, we have to learn what is it about uh, about that ladder within the institution. What is what are the barriers for our students? Um, so, and I want to go a little bit deeper into what some of those things uh, that are breaking the ladder are. So, one of them is implicit bias which refers to attitudes and stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious, uh, unconscious manner. And we all hold implicit bias. It's uh, kind of like it's in the air we breathe, right? And, um, and so it's only, we can only mitigate it when it's um, kind of at the forefront of our minds. Right, um, but we all have uh, have implicit biases, and one of the things that kind of shows our implicit bias is when we ask questions that um, that that make us pause for a second. And for then, this is the image um, from Race Forward is an example of one of those uh, pauses. Right, when he said one of one of the two people above is a convicted felon. And it, it might cause some pause for folks uh, because of um, the policing of particularly Black men uh, and because of the over-incarceration of that population. Uh, you might think that Snoop Dogg is the convicted cell, and that might be where your mind goes to first, even if you already know the story of how Mark their Stewart um, I mean, right, committed fraud and, and was sent to prison for, for fraud. Um, but it doesn't make sense to us right away. And part of that is because our, of our racial biases. Another is uh, microaggressions, um, of which Gerald Wingstu uh, writes a lot about. And there's also um, a really great uh, webinar done that was just done last week or this week for, uh, by, by Luke, Dr. Luke Wood and uh, Dr. Frank Harris III um, that talked about racial microaggressions um, and how they are 
uh, relevant particular to, particularly to our situation right now. And I'll make sure that you have a link um, to those webinars which are available on their YouTube channel. Uh, but what microaggressions are, for those of you who don't know, are um, everyday verbal, nonverbal uh, slights, snubs or insults, uh, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicates hostile, derogatory, or negative messages uh, to target persons based solely on their marginalized group membership. So you, that might be something like uh, being surprised, you know, someone, uh, say, a Black person being a mathematician and someone being surprised oh, I, you're a mathematician? Wow, that's amazing, right? And kind of feeling like that um, uh, that, that person uh, is, is an outlier, right, uh, for, for being a mathematician. Um, it, uh, it might be just kind of stepping back or feeling afraid when looking at, uh, when seeing a person of color and being startled, right? It's just, uh, for those who are racially minoritized or, you know, and uh, for, for women and other groups, uh, minoritized groups, it's things that even if people don't intend them the way they do, they make you ask, was that said because I'm blank, right? So those are the things that students are experiencing every day, right, uh, within our institutions and classrooms. And even it, though it might be a small thing, the accumulation of them and also just the, the knowledge of where that's coming from is reinforcing a belief, uh, it, it, a stereotypical belief, right? Whether that belief is that I'm a criminal or that I'm unintelligent, right? Those are the kinds of, um, of messages that where that racially minoritized students are receiving every day. There's many other things that are contributing to the racially, you know, broken ladder, um, and uh, you know, we we don't have the time to cover them all today. But here are some of them: uh, stereotype threat, racial battle fatigue, uh, white fragility, imposter syndrome. Uh, whiteness. These are all uh, really great topics to start to read on if you start, if, you know, in order to become racially literate. Um, so I would say if, you know, you don't know where to start on being able to, being able to be a more kind of critical and, um, and, uh, and culturally relevant uh, practitioner, Starting to read some of uh, these books is a really great way to start um, to build your knowledge base and therefore be able to kind of show up authentically as a practitioner who is doing the work in order um, to close the, the racial equity gaps and to be able to serve students and particularly racially minoritized students in an authentic way. Okay, so and then within that same picture, you know, especially coming up through the 90s, um, diversity became a really uh, popular term. And uh, so since we've, we've since moved to equity, and so what's the difference, right? What's the difference between uh, diversity and equity? And what we found, and um, Highline, uh, you know, should know this as the most diverse um, campus in Washington State, um, diversity is bringing more students to this broken ladder, right, to this unequal pathway. Uh, and that's why, although there was um, some hypotheses that, well, if we just diversify our higher education institutions, then that'll solve the problem. Everyone kind of just being together and learning from each other that will solve the problem. But as we see, especially within community colleges around the United States, and especially in places like California and Washington, um, just bringing, just access, right, um, is, does not mean equity. 
um, uh, that's not automatically going to solve the problem. And so diversity really is about access, right? Who uh, is able to come into the door? Who is at the table? Which is a, still an important question to ask, especially in places that are still not diverse. Um, but when we're talking about equity, we're really talking about redirecting resources to the pathway, understanding that there is a broken ladder, and therefore being uh, able to build awareness and knowledge um, and be able to ask the questions uh, to be able to fix that broken ladder within our institutions. And that part of those things that I'll talk about today is regular data disaggregation and analysis, uh, setting goals, um, you know, providing trainings like this and more, right? Uh, and, and, and practicing inquiry to understand how our practices impede equity. And at Q, you know, that's what we strive to do. We strive to create tools that would help practitioners to ask questions about their own practice. And we hope that that's what we'll do um, for, for the rest of today. Uh, we say that there are two dimensions of equity um, at the Center for Urban Education. The first is the, or one of them, is the accountability dimension. And that's uh, proportional representation of historically marginalized groups and, and educational outcomes. Um, so really that's in the data. What is the data saying about racially minoritized groups at the college? And uh, I'll go a little bit more into that shortly. The second dimension is an equally important dimension, and that is uh, the recognition that institutional racism and other isms are an entrenched characteristic of our institutions that have to be dismantled with strategies that are race conscious, right? And informed by critical theories of race, uh, including whiteness, right? And so, uh, and that in, is, is, is sometimes a very, a much harder one to, to understand, right? And that requires us to become more racially literate as practitioners, because unfortunately, our education system and the way that we've been socialized in higher education has not taught us to be um, racially literate yet, right? Um, and, so, uh, and so it is these two dimensions of equity that are equally important uh, into making equity a reality on campus. So um, if we go back to thinking about the accountability dimension, right? Um, Equity can, seen as, can be seen as uh, proportionality, basically, right? So we would, for example, expect that if an entering student population is 56% uh, white students, 32% uh, Latinx students, um, that the graduating, that graduating student cohort, 68% of those graduating would be white students and 32%, sorry, that's um, backwards, 32% uh, of those graduating would be Latinx students. So in this case, sorry, that's probably, uh, that was on purpose. This is not equitable, right? So if we have only 23% here and 32 coming in. So again, like I said, um, representational equity, uh, if, if these numbers add up, then we would say that's equitable, right? The data is showing that there is, um, that we're not, that we have equity in terms of the folks who are coming into the institution and those who are graduating. Another important part of, um, of the accountability dimension is disaggregating data. Right. So for any student population that you all are interested in at Highline College, um, it's important to be able to uh, to get the data to see how they are how they are navigating the institution. What what does their success look like? What does success mean? And what does their success look like? 
And why we say it's so important to disaggregate data is that you might have, you know, a total number. So this is an example. Say there's 60% course success rates in any given semester at an institution. What that might be hiding, right, is um, is is all sorts of different numbers for different racially minoritized groups, right? So that might be uh, hiding then uh, of only a a forty percent success rate for for black students, um, whereas Asian students or white students might be doing much better, and that might be what's pushing the aggregate numbers up. Right, so it's important to be able to see these differences to see what is the data saying about how we're doing at the institution. So um, I want to uh, pose a question, and I'm not. And if um, if you want to reply in the comment box, um, that's that's okay. And if you don't want to reply, that's fine as well. Um, but, you know, what hunches do you hear uh, people put forward to explain why racial ethnic uh, inequities exist? And, and how does education then usually take on racial ethnic inequity? And while I'm pausing there, I'm just going to um, go to the Q&A to make sure that there are no questions for me, but if you have a question. Uh-huh. Someone said higher education thinks of remediation, right? Absolutely. Uh, uh, someone said, I've heard faculty, uh, Allison says, I've heard faculty dismiss this as a pipeline problem. Yeah. Someday it'll get better and it'll all go away. Some faculty say those students have more uh, barriers and are not as college ready. Yeah. Create more clubs. All right. Yes. Certain cultures value. Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. So this is. Um, that's good. And I'm looking at some questions now as well. Is the book list available somewhere? I'll, um, I'll make sure that you have access to this presentation um, afterwards. And I believe this is being recorded as well. Um, and that way you can, you're able to look up all the books that we have. Yes, so I'll be able to list the resources that I give and be able to send it to you all. Oh, I have a good... Um, question about uh, where do where do Arab Middle Eastern fit in your data? And um, that's a really great question um, because there's still, so there's still issues, even if we look at the course success rates that are there now, right, that I say have been disaggregated. There's many populations within uh, these categories that have not been uh, uh, disaggregated, right? So even um, even Asian populations or Pacific Islander populations, especially at Highline that has uh, that is an a API uh, or an, an APZ, um, you know, those are really important um, things to disaggregate further, and uh, and it is important to uh, we realize uh, right that there's some experiences that are very specific to the. Arab or Middle Eastern community, uh, and if it makes sense and is, and you're able to disaggregate that data, uh, then I say absolutely, let's do that. Let's have that conversation, right? Uh, and and that's a conversation that you need to have as an institution, right? Um, especially if you're hearing, I have a lot of Arab and Middle Eastern students that are experiencing a lot of microaggressions that are. Um, and I and we see in the data that they're doing that they're not doing as well, but you can't do that until you disaggregate. Okay, so let's move on. Yeah, and so um, you you um, so you said a lot of these things, right? So this is kind of the way that 
higher education respond to more support centers, more developmental courses or remediation, maybe more tutoring, um, more advising, more early alert um, pathways, maybe, you know, oh, students just need to have more grit or growth mindset. Right, so these are some of the ways that higher education might respond um, to this. And as we move on, I hope to problematize, right, some of the ways that higher education um, responds to, to this data. And some of you have already can basically uh, know where I'm going with this, right, in, in terms of um, a, a deficit mindset. So before we move into kind of cognitive frames and equity mindedness and deficit mindedness, um, let me make sure uh, that I have answered all your questions. So there was, yes, yes. So uh, what about Southeast Asian communities? How reflective is it? Absolutely. So again, really um, breaking down the, that Asian category, um, Asian American category is really important. Okay, so um, uh, so what is equity mindedness? All right, I'm, I'm getting, um, I'm, I'm wanting to read your comments, <laughs> but I'll get to them in a moment. Um, so what is equity mindedness? So uh, before we talk about what equity mindedness is, it's important to understand what is a cognitive frame. Um, and you know our, our cognitive frames is, is something that um, Stella Benzimon, who's the director of Center Urban for Urban Education, did some research on, and she found um, that people had different mental maps, right? A cognitive frame is a mental map, attitude, and belief that a person maintains to make sense of the world, and they determine um, things like the questions that we ask, the uh, information that's collected, what we notice how problems are defined, what courses of action should be taken. Um, and so, like many of you said in the comment box, right, our, a very common um, cognitive frame with, within higher education is this deficit-minded frame, right? And what a deficit-minded frame is, it's one that focuses solely on students. Right, so like a student's preparedness, motivation, commitment, self-discipline, um, or even their kind of their their environment, right? Um, where where they're coming from, whether they have a family, um, it's really focusing just on students and on things that we cannot control. They rely on unexamined assumptions right? and uh, and on stereotypes and bias. Right, so when we say something like, well, you know, um, Latinx students, um, you know, they're, they're just so busy with their families and they're working. So it's very difficult to, um, uh, for them to be able to be successful. And there's issues with, there's a lot of issues with that. One is that it relies on stereotypes, right? Not all, not all Latinx students have um, you know, family obligations outside or have a job outside. Um, but it also uh, erases the experiences um, of Latinx students who did have family obligations, did have uh, a job outside and were successful, usually because they had practitioners who were able to uh, guide them through and navigating the institution, right? Um, and uh, because sometimes it's because of luck, right? That they found someone that was able to advocate for them. Uh, so how do we make it normal, right, for a student to be able to succeed given that they have other responsibilities. We're all juggling different responsibilities, right? So that shouldn't necessarily be an excuse to, um, for a student not to succeed.
Now, we say um, equity-minded, so instead of being deficit-minded, we want practitioners to be equity-minded. And we feel like this is a huge key to creating a, a equity-oriented institutions. Uh, we say, let's not focus on best practices, let's focus on best practitioners. And, uh, and the best practitioners, we feel, are equity-minded practitioners. And those are practitioners who are race-conscious, in a positive sense, right? And so, which means that um, they're, they're racially literate, they understand these um, uh, structural racism and how uh, racism lives within the institution. So they are able to see race and understand that that is a big um, barrier uh, for, that these experiences are big barriers for students as they navigate the institution. Um, they're aware of racially bound beliefs and values. Um, they use the data, right, to be able to uh, tell some of the story uh, of student experiences. They're practitioner focused. What is it that I do and how, um, and, and how is it that that might be contributing to the gap, right? Uh, and they're action oriented. Um, so at some point, it's really important to have these conversations, um, but it's also equally important to be able to then move it to action. Um, so I'm going to go through a little exercise with you all to kind of talk about um, when people say things, you know, how can we start to categorize them and be able to, um, to recognize them as being deficit? Uh, and that way we're more able to then change even maybe the, the things that we say, right? And realize, oh, that's, that was very deficit-minded and start to change the way that, that we start to talk about students uh, and that others at the institution start to talk about students. So we're gonna, I'm gonna have a quote out here. We're gonna read the quote. And then, um, and then we're going to decide uh, where, where to put that quote, and, and we'll discuss it. And we're going to put the quote um, according uh, to, this, to this plane. So up top, we have institutionally oriented. Um, also, we say practitioner oriented um, versus student deficit oriented. So is this is asking whether the quote is uh, focused on the institution or the practitioner, or whether it's focused on the student. Uh, and then on either side, we have colorblind, right? Is the, um, is the, is the statement, um, uh, you know, colorblind and that it's kind of talking about all students, putting all students in the same uh, bucket, or is it race conscious, right? Is it um, talking about a specific racial group or, or, or um, racial groups? So this is our first, um, our first quote. Students don't do their homework because in high school, all they had to do was pass the final. Race doesn't matter. It's just that our students are young and have a sense of entitlement. They think they should just pass just for showing up and they don't even show up all the time. So if uh, people can comment in the box, you think that is institutionally oriented or student deficit oriented? Yeah, I see a lot of student deficit and I'm, say, I'm seeing student deficit and we hear it all the time. And is it race conscious or colorblind? Yep. Yeah, so we're seeing, uh, so it's not talking about a particular racial group, but it's still being ve uh, very deficit oriented. And, part and, and this is um, particularly problematic, especially for a college like Highline College, because as you said, Highland College has a very high percentage of racially minoritized students. So even when you're talking about all students, there's still 
something about talking about all students that still seems racialized, even though we're not putting, we're not saying it's about race, right? So that's, um, so that's very tricky. Let's go to the next one. All right, so, um, okay, so black students are clearly not completing pre-calculus at the same rate as other student groups. Their families don't value education like Asian families do. Is that institutionally oriented, student deficit oriented? Someone said a uh, first racist and then student deficit. <laughs> yeah, so um, so I, I'm seeing a lot of correct answers. Um, so that is race conscious student deficit. And even though, I mean, this is not always straightforward, right? Even though it's race conscious, again, we're also uh, a Asian, uh, Asian families, that's, that spans many different um, ethnic groups, right? So, um, so it's, it's, uh, it's certainly not um, a, a complicated or racially literate um, thing to say. Professor Rivera added an assignment to his syllabus requiring students to visit his office hours. He acknowledged that the difficulty is getting them there. He commented on the potentially stigmatizing effect of sending individual Latino students to his office hours, noting they might be intimidated or remember past meetings with professors that weren't supportive. To counter that, he created an assignment requiring all students to visit his office hours at least once, and he spent the time getting to know them better. He also took class time to show his students where his office is located. Yep, so I'm seeing some answers come in. In I'm seeing institutionally oriented. Ooh, someone said institutional and colorblind. I'm wondering why. So we're saying I uh um and I think we're saying it's race conscious because he's really focusing on his Latino students and now here I'm making assumptions that, you know, maybe he saw that particularly he was having trouble with his, with his Latino students going to office hours. And that is why he really focused on that group when changing his practice, right? And thinking what is it that, he's been, that is going to bring them in. Um, and he's also acknowledging through that, right? That there is a history Right of especially with uh, with black and brown students around um, uh, uh, their relationship to authority, right? And their relate their relationship to authority can really um, uh, hinder the ways that students um, uh, interact with faculty around things like office hours. Um, so un acknowledging that. He creates, he tries to create a space uh, in which his students don't feel intimidated and know that his office is a safe space to be. The last one, like, I, I honestly don't like, don't look at my students. Their heritage is not in my head. Here's everybody. What can I do to keep them interested in what I'm doing? All right, I'm seeing answers come in. Yep. So that's, that goes in the last one, institutionally oriented and colorblind. So now um, hopefully that helps you to kind of start to be able to point out when people are saying things that are student deficit, um, you know, and, and really, than trying to dig deeper. You know, when you're saying these students, who are you actually talking about? 
um, and, you know, and really debunking those assumptions and stereotypes that are going into those student deficit oriented um, statements. Okay, and then let's do our last polling question. Uh, so the question is, think of uh, the faculty, staff, and administrators you work with the most frequently. Do you often hear uh, institutionally oriented colorblind frame? B, institutional uh, oriented race conscious frame? C, student deficit oriented and colorblind frame? Or D, a student deficit oriented and race conscious frame? Um, let me bring up the, oops. I'm sorry. I believe I was sharing that poll the entire time. Go to three. Launch that poll. Um, so while while we're waiting for things to come in, I know that there are some questions, and let me get to at least one of them. Um, if we can. The, bring questions, any uh, other questions into our breakout rooms um, so that we can answer them at the beginning of our breakout session. Um, let me end this poll, share the results so you can see them, and let me find my question and answer box. There we go. Uh, so Teresa, how has our socialization process from infancy to adulthood and beyond add to implicit bias? So that's a really great question and a very complex one, but um, there, are, there are many, many different ways in which we are socialized um, into kind of understanding these stereotypes without even thinking about them. Uh, for example, the media, media is a big um, part of that. Right, um, we grew up um, watching movies in which, right, the uh, the black person died first, right, in which um, uh, Latinx and LGBTQ folks are not the main person of the story, right, and so these are our ways in which, um, because those stories are not uh, there, we um, we tend to be able to dehumanize these uh these groups of people um easier um and uh and and because of the roles that they did play right they might play um someone who was less intelligent they might play someone um who was uh the bad guy or you know um who was um delinquent uh and so part of that is the way that we um that that we solidify that, but also because of the ways that structural racism works, and because, for example, um, black and brown communities are overly policed, that's why we see right incarceration rates that are um, uh, where we see um, uh, racially minoritized folks more likely to be incarcerated, and that starts to um, to then build this idea that we have, right, that racially minoritized folks are more delinquent, um, are less intelligent, right? Um, because we don't see these folks in um, positions of authority, are in our faculty, right, in higher education and leadership positions within higher education as much. There's everyday things that we go to again it's the air we breathe right and so the socialization process is constantly um uh, uh fortifying itself in our mind yes uh bob is bringing up psychology which is a big part of 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 this right of how racism exists it's, it's it's unfortunately in our brain, the way that our brain works and the way that we make sense of very complex information, it's very easy for us to um, put things into boxes. And so things like um, attribution theory uh, and attribution error, right, um, is a big part of why implicit bias happens. Oh, uh, how do learning communities such as Umoja and Puente um, fit or don't fit in um, with 
education, institutional equity, equity-minded practice? What kind of frame are these based on? I love this question because um, I love Emoja, I love Fuente, and we find usually that these, um, that these are um, programs that work, right? That work for Latinx students and that work, I'm seeing the time, and that work for um, our African-American students or black students. Um, but the fact that they are just programs, that they still live at the margins of the institution, um, that is where the, the institutional racism comes in, right? If they work, then why can't we scale that to every part of the institution, right? And so it is about really decentering white, that is a big part of decentering whiteness, right? Which is uh, if we were to center some of these other really cultural components into our institutions, then we would be able to see these different results that we do see at a smaller scale within, uh, within these programs. All right, so I have about one minute and I'm going to very quickly kind of uh, just go through this one slide um, because usually we look at this data, we look at gaps in educational outcomes and then we just say, okay, what's the best practice that others um, are doing and let's do that best practice, right? Um, and, uh, and that's usually kind of higher education's um, uh, way to try to close racial equity gaps. What Q found is that we're kind of missing some steps in there uh, because we have to look, see that data, see those gaps, and then we have to step back and ask ourselves, why is it that those gaps are the way they are? Uh, and we need to, that, that requires a step of inquiry, really looking further into our practices to understand where within the institutions are, uh, are these gaps really happening? And where within my practice are these gaps potentially happening? So it is only within, through inquiry that we can move to have more informed interventions. So not to say that best practices don't work, but that best practice, uh, but that best practice is just just kind of getting what what someone else is doing and applying it to Highline without really understanding the context of Highline, understanding the institutional racism that is um, going into that gap. Then we we can't really make a very informed uh, understanding about whether that best practice is going to work or not. And even with informed interventions, you can you can make a change and it still may not work. But um, uh, which is why you know there's there's that circle there of evaluation um, and intervention, uh, evaluation of interventions. Um, but it is really important that we engage in more informed interventions. And hopefully our breakout sessions we can talk more about how to do that. All right. Well, at this time, if we could all give like a virtual um something some love some highline virtual <laughs> love to esmeralda thank you so much for being here this was an awesome way to start feel free to put some love and thoughts and highline vibes in the chat box um as well i can see that on this side of it so thank you everyone we are about to launch into a break oh my gosh you're getting so much love oh i love yes, the chat box. i love it the chat box has been on fire y'all like this is great <laughs> this is the best way to start it out so we built in a little break. We know we need stretch breaks, body breaks, take care of yourself. In the chat box, I'm gonna provide some instructions around finding the link for your next session, which is basically in your email or on the EDI website. So um, if you could make the time to find your right link and attend the session you RSVP, RSVP'd for, that'd be awesome. And let's continue the discussion and breakouts. See you soon. We get started back at 2.15.